Slow Burn Media and Bill Huffman present this week's episode of My Passion Case with Robin Warder of The Trail Went Cold. It was a mass murder he swears he never committed. In this case, the judge overrode the jury's recommendation and sentenced the defendant to death. Tommy Ziegler was sentenced to death by a judge who overruled a jury in 1976. Now, a judge could do that back then. Today, that's unconstitutional. They got a, they got a conviction. And here I am stuck. He did say they make a strong argument for new DNA testing that would prove once and for all whether Tommy Ziegler committed the crimes that sent him to death row. Yes, my recommendations for future for further DNA testing was included in that report, yes. For one local man who has been on death row for more than 35 years, a hearing today might be his last chance. Attorneys for Tommy Ziegler say he was not a killer of his wife, in-laws, and another man, but instead a victim. It started on Christmas Eve, 1975, when police were called to Ziegler's Furniture Store. My experience has been in 32 years of practicing law that most judges, in most cases, if a motion to recuse a file, will do it as a matter of course to eliminate any doubt as to whether or not someone's being treated fairly. She complained that one of the jurors was clicking the gun, uh, which, which, which probably occurred. I mean, that's part of, you know, the jury's got all this stuff there in the evidence room and they're talking, I mean, in the jury room and they're talking about it. So. It was a mass murder he swears he never committed. The only thing I've got is a little bit of breath left. The prosecution never allowed jurors to hear testimony that would have created reasonable doubt. Hello and welcome to another episode of My Passion Case. I am your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media production. On this week's episode, I will be talking with one Robin Warder of The Trail Went Cold about the Tommy Ziegler case in Florida. And he has been on death row for a number of years for a conviction that he claims is wrong. So Robin knows this story really well, and we're going to just go right into my weekly conversation with Robin Warder of The Trail Went Cold. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be uh, joined with uh, Robin Warder, who hosts The Trail Went Cold, which is a very popular podcast in the true crime genre. And on this week's case, we are going to discuss... Uh, we're going to be t discussing the uh, controversial conviction of Tommy Ziegler, who has been on death row in Florida for the past 43 years for committing four murders on his in his furniture store on Christmas Eve in 1975 in the town of Winter Garden, Florida. And for the past four decades, he has maintained that he's completely innocent. And the case is so controversial that they have never gone through with his execution, but they don't want to release him either. So he's still there at the age of 74, I think it is right now. Yeah, I was reading that he had uh, he had been accused and then, you know, he had shot apparently uh you know there's a whole lot of background that goes into this story so i'll let you tell the story but uh go ahead and introduce yourself as well uh my name is robin warder i host a true crime podcast called the trail went cold uh we've been going since february of 2016 and i do a different cold case or unsolved mystery every single week in which i go over the case and then give my theories and analysis about what i think might have happened and i specifically love to do a lot of cases that were on the tv show unsolved mysteries because it was my favorite true crime show ever and today's case was featured on it back in the late 90s but their segment didn't even really scratch the surface of how convoluted this story is i mean just from the little bit of research that i did on the case it, it definitely barely scratches the surface so what is it about this case that that makes it so interesting to you well, it's pretty much the most convoluted murder case I've ever come across, where I went into it not knowing whether Tommy Ziegler was guilty or innocent because there was just so much information, such a large cast of characters. And I remember when I did my podcast episode about it, I took the approach of the Rashomon effect from the Akira Kurosawa film Rashomon, which shows uh, the events in the narrative from the different points of view of different characters, but the details are different each time around. And 
That's kind of what this case is, where over the course of a period of nearly two and a half hours on Christmas Eve, uh, four people wound up being murdered, and each witness, including Tommy Ziegler, tells a different version of events, uh, which often contradict each other. And I, quite frankly, I still don't know if any of these versions are the real truth. It's just so hard to garner like the truth from reality and figure out what actually happened in this case. Give me a little bit of, uh, you know, the five W's, you know, the who, what, where, when, uh, when this took place and, uh, you know, the players involved. Well, like I mentioned, it was on uh, Christmas Eve in 1975 in the town of Winter Garden, Florida. And Tommy Ziegler was married to his wife, Eunice, and they seemed to be very happily married from what everyone thought. They seemed to have the perfect life. Tommy worked at his family's furniture store, the W.T. Ziegler Furniture Store, and they were worth a lot of money. Apparently, they had a net worth of around $1 million at that point. So on the surface, he didn't seem like anyone who would have a motive to commit murder. And for Christmas, uh, Eunice's parents, uh, Perry and Virginia Edward, were visiting from uh, Georgia for the holidays. And the plan was that Eunice was going to drive her parents to the furniture store and they were, her and Tommy were going to present them with a recliner as a Christmas gift. And uh, what, and afterwards they were going to go to a church service. But the story Tommy gives is that uh, he was going to, the Eunice and, the, and his in-laws were going to go there separately and he would meet them there while an employee from his store named Edward Williams uh, joined him at home And afterward, they gave them the chair. They were going to do deliveries uh, throughout uh, some last-minute Christmas presents, and then he would join Eunice and his in-laws at the church. And Tommy's story is that him and Williams drove to the furniture store together, and that when he went inside, uh, it was all dark, and then he was attacked by several people, which knocked his glasses off so he could not see a thing. And after a struggle, he was able to grab a gun from his office drawer, fire off a shot, but then he took a shot to the abdomen and passed out from blood loss. Uh, He woke up about uh, two hours later, and he wound up calling uh, the police chief of Winter Garden named Don Ficky who was one of his best friends because he had been planning to meet him at a Christmas party later that night. So he called Ficky at the party and said, I've been shot and attacked in the furniture store. Uh, The police soon arrived. And at that point, Tommy was given medical attention, but he did not know that Eunice and his in-laws, Perry and Virginia, had been murdered in the store. Uh, They were all found shot to death inside. And also a fourth man, a black man named Charlie Mays, who was a regular customer at the furniture store, his body was also found in there. So it was a complete massacre. I think a total of 28 shots were fired from, I think, five guns, and all the guns were scattered throughout the furniture store. But uh, police looked at the scene, and they became suspicious and found some discrepancies in Tommy's story and came to the conclusion that he had murdered all four people himself, and that he had stuffed cash and receipts in Charlie Mays' pockets to make it look it was a robbery, and that Mays had killed them. And so they figured that he inflicted the gunshot wound on his own abdomen to make it look like he was attacked, and uh, then called the police for help, pretending he had been attacked in a robbery. But they thought he orchestrated the whole thing and then charged him with all four murders, and he would go on trial a couple months later, was found guilty, and received the death penalty. He received the death penalty, but like you had mentioned earlier, he has yet to be executed. Well, there's a lot of controversy about the trial because the trial judge, Maurice Paul, he did not like uh, Tommy personally. Uh, Earlier that year, they had actually testified as witnesses at a civil trial on an opposing side. Uh, They were character witnesses. And the guy that Tommy testified on behalf of won the trial, and the the defendant wound up losing his job. So, of course, that automatically made Judge Paul have a grudge against him. So he was very biased throughout the trial. He would always uh, take all the prosecution's prosecution's objections. He would never rule in favor of the defense. And uh, when it went to the jury, there was this one lone holdout juror who uh, did not believe Tommy was guilty and wanted to vote to acquit. And the other jurors were so certain that they started bullying her and intimidating her. And at one point, they took one of the murder weapons, which had been brought into the jury room as evidence, and pulled the empty gun to her head and pulled the trigger. 
and she pretty much had a complete nervous breakdown. <laughs> and when Judge Paul heard about this, um, he ordered the uh, woman's physician to prescribe her more medication, and that pretty much destroyed her will so that she eventually decided to vote guilty, and that's how he was found guilty. But over the years, this woman has completely regretted his decision and still believes Tommy was innocent. So uh, his defense thought that that alone should have secured him a new trial, but it never did. The closest he came to being executed, I think, was in 1986, where uh, he was, I think, 24 to 48 hours away from execution. And his defense attorney, Vernon Davids, actually filed a motion where he said, my own representation at the trial was incompetent. I provided inadequate counsel. And it actually worked. Uh, they offered him a stay of execution, and he has never come that close to being executed again. But this is pretty much the only case I can think of where a defendant who's on death row has their own lawyer has put their own reputation on the line and said they were incompetent in order to halt his ex execution and save his life. Yeah, I would definitely say that this is definitely an unusual case in that regard. I mean, anytime you have a lawyer you know, back in their client like that, I mean, they have to have some serious belief that the their client's obviously not guilty. So, I mean, how do you feel about that? Oh, I definitely agree because I know even if you believe your client is guilty, a, a defense lawyer has to represent them to their very best and do everything they can to stop them from being executed. But it doesn't really require you to put your own professional reputation on the line and say you were incompetent and uh, pretty much open yourself up to public ridicule. But Vernon Davids did that, and I don't think he would have done so if he did not genuinely 100% believe that Tommy was innocent. So what was the end result of that particular situation where he had declared himself incompetent, and uh, what was the judge's decision on that, you well, know, in that regard? Well, they did uh, halt his execution, but they've been unable to get his conviction overturned. Uh, I know uh, when I was putting together my podcast episode, I consulted with a woman named Lynn Marie Cardi, who uh, has become Tommy's defense investigator and has worked pro bono for him for the past uh, several years. And uh, he did get an evidentiary hearing uh, a couple years ago, or I think it was like 2002, where they performed new DNA testing, which kind of cleared him, but it did not completely exonerate him. It's, it's because they had found uh, some blood underneath his shirt, like underneath his armpit. And during the original trial, the, the, the prosecution's theory is that he had put his father-in-law, Perry Edwards, in a headlock and beat him with a metal crank because a metal crank was found at the scene. And that's how the blood got there. And because Perry Edwards' blood uh, had the same blood type, they automatically assumed it was his blood because they didn't have DNA testing back then. But then they performed new testing and found out that the blood belonged to Charlie Mays. And that doesn't really clear Tommy because he was still accused of uh, shooting Charlie Mays. But the issue is that he claimed he got into a struggle in the dark when he first entered the furniture store and uh, that when he fired off the gun in self-defense, he thinks he actually shot Charlie Mays. And when he woke up in the dark, he crawled over his body. So he could have gotten Mays' blood on his shirt accidentally without actually killing him. But another interesting revelation in the DNA testing is that some blood on Mays' pants leg that they thought uh, belonged to him actually belonged to Perry Edwards Sr., but Perry Sr. Uh, was killed about 50 feet away at the other side of the furniture store. So there's no logical reason for his blood to be on Maze's pant legs, which kind of lends credence to the idea that this was an elaborate setup and that Charlie Mays was involved and killed Perry Edwards. The Charlie Mays aspect of the whole case, I, I find very intriguing. And where do you fall like, as far as that goes? I mean, with Charlie and you know, his connection to the case? Well, uh, the original cover story is that uh, he had been at Tommy's furniture store earlier that morning to pick up some linoleum, and his wife claimed that uh, Tommy had told him that they were going to give him a TV set as a Christmas present to present to his family after the store was closing and that he would give it to him on credit so he didn't have to pay it right away. So the theory is that May showed up at the furniture store uh, 
to uh, pick up the TV set, but then Tommy killed him and tried to set him up as the fall guy. But there are a lot of holes in this theory, and I haven't even talked about this prosecution witness yet named uh, Felton Thomas, who uh, accompanied uh, Mays to the furniture store that night because he claimed that Mays asked him to help him move the TV set. And one of the biggest holes in the story is that they parked their van in the alley behind the furniture store inside a fenced-in area, whereas the most logical place to park his van would have been the front of the store to carry the TV set out, whereas going inside this fence you have to go through this maze of wire and stuff to load the tv set in the van so it doesn't make much sense and thomas's story is that after he arrived uh they arrived tommy arrived and said that oh uh we can't get into the furniture store yet uh someone is supposed to deliver me the keys but uh, while we're waiting, do you mind uh, accompanying me to this remote field? Because I just received these new guns and I want to test them out. <laughs> so Thomas claimed that him and Mays accompanied Tommy to the field where he fired off a few shots and then he gave Mays and Thomas the guns and asked them to try it out. And the prosecution's theory was that he was trying to get their fingerprints and gunshot residue on the gun in order to frame them for the robbery. Uh, So what happened next is that Tommy went to his house to pick up an extra set of keys and then drove back to the furniture store. And uh, once Mays went inside, Thomas said that he got a really bad feeling and he decided to run away. And this is presumably when uh, uh, Ziegler killed Mays inside the store. And then when Thomas found out about it hours later, he turned himself into the police and gave the story. But the big problem is that all the guns found at the murder scene, they were all wiped clean of fingerprints. So it makes no sense for him to get Mays and Thomas to fire these guns to get their prints on it. And they even searched the field to try to find any bullets that he might have fired to support the story. And they did find one slug, but they did not match any of the guns at the furniture store. So uh, there are a lot of issues with Thomas's testimony, and it seems more and more likely that Mays' story about going to pick up a TV set at the store is bunk, and that he was originally supposed to be involved in the murders, and that the reason he wound up dead is because Tommy shot him in self-defense, and his co-conspirators uh, finished the job and killed him because they knew they couldn't take him to a hospital, and he would be a liability. Seems like a lot of uh, leaps to uh, get to that conclusion. Uh, I would say, you know, the the biggest thing that stands out on that aspect of the story is why are there five guns at one shooting? It's true. Like, um, I know the story is that uh, Tommy allegedly... Uh, that I, I was telling you about the handyman of his, Edward Williams, that he was driving to the store with. Williams was the other big prosecution witness at the trial. And he claimed that months earlier, Tommy had uh, asked him about getting some uh, un- uh, some clean guns that could not be traced back to him. And that six months beforehand, he used Williams as an intermediary to buy these guns to give to him. And they presume that he was going to use them as part of this murder plot. But the problem is that most of the victims were not actually shot with those guns. They were shot with Tommy's personal guns. So it's kind of negating the entire plan. So... It seems to lend credence to the idea that there were multiple people there who fired all these guns because it would turn out that years later, these witnesses uh, claimed they had drove by the store at around something like 720 or so when the murders took place, and they thought they heard a succession of gunshots like back to back to back, which sounded like multiple people firing multiple guns at once when the murders took place. But they apparently went to this, the police with this information and were told they were not needed, and it was only after Tommy was convicted that they came forward and gave their story to the the defense and said, this lends credence to this being a job involving multiple people and not just Tommy Ziegler, because it seems impossible for him to have fired that amount of shots in succession by himself. So why did they settle on Ziegler as the the culprit? I mean, because it was days after the actual, you know, the robbery slash murders that he was uh you know even thought of as a suspect well uh a lot the person who apparently put the idea into the police's head is a guy that some people believe was the real mastermind behind this plan and that's perry edwards jr Eunice's brother who was 
staying behind in Georgia while Christmas was going on. And this guy, uh, he was a deputy prison warden, and he apparently was abusive to his own family and did not get along well with his parents. And the story goes that uh, Perry Sr. was looking to cut Perry Jr. out of his will, and uh, he uh, brought, he wanted to make Tommy the executor to his will and inherit his estate, which I think was around $3 million or so. Uh, but uh, the process never went through. So when Eunice, Perry Sr. and Virginia died, Perry Jr. wound up inheriting everything. But uh, he was actually a good friend with the lead investigator on the case, Don Fry. And uh, after the murders took place, he went up to Fry and said, uh, uh, you may not know this, but Eunice, Eunice was planning to divorce Tommy on this particular night because she had caught him in bed with another man and that Tommy was a closet homosexual. So uh, they immediately figured that this was his motive for the murder is that he was he was interested in men and that Eunice was going to divorce him and uh, also ruin his reputation because this was 1975 in the South. So being outed as a gay man would just completely destroy him back then. And in addition, he had also taken out an insurance policy on Eunice, I think about six months earlier for $500,000, which could make him look suspicious, but... Uh, he was already wealthy at this point. He was worth nearly $1 million. So getting an extra $500,000 from his wife's murder really wasn't going to help him too much. Uh, they tried to corroborate these homosexuality claims. Apparently a woman who was Eunice's hairdresser came forward to corroborate the story saying that, oh yeah, Eunice told me she had caught Tommy in bed with another man and is going to divorce him. But uh, she was the only one who could corroborate it, and she was apparently not a very unreliable witness. They searched pretty hard, but they could not find anyone who could conclusively confirm that Tommy was having affairs with other men. Yeah, you know, it does seem like that's kind of like a fallback excuse for a lot of these cases. Like, oh, you know, he was having a secret affair. He was uh, living a double life. It just, all it seems to be is passing the blame to somebody else, in my opinion, when they go to that route. I mean, obviously there is somebody here that is clearly, clearly responsible. Where do you stand on like the trial, the fact that he's still in jail and there really hasn't been much hope for him as far as if he did it or didn't do it. Well, that's the thing is it would be really hard to conclusively prove that he didn't do it just because there was so much evidence around. And like I said, they did DNA testing, which showed that the blood that was on his shirt did not belong to one victim, but it belonged to another victim. So it did not completely exonerate him. But ever since then, they have been unable to secure further DNA testing on him. I think they're just kind of hoping that Tommy will just die in prison of natural causes, and then they can just sweep it under the rug, because they know that uh, if they try to execute him, there will be a major backlash, but they also don't want to admit that they screwed up in a huge way and release him from prison. And Perry Edwards Jr., I, I mentioned earlier that Lynn Marie Carty was the main investigator working for the defense right now, and she found some compelling evidence to suggest that he was involved in the whole thing. Uh, mainly the fact that uh, when Eunice was killed, uh, her uh, family ring she owned mysteriously went missing from her finger, and they figured it was part of the robbery and that whoever shot up the store stole it from her. But then years later, Perry Jr.'s granddaughter would claim that uh, he, her nanny had uh, put a ring in a safety deposit box in the bank and said that this used to belong to your Aunt Eunice and you will get it when you get older. And they're thinking, well, how would Perry Jr. have gotten a hold of this ring unless he was involved? But uh, he died in uh, of a heart attack several years ago, so it's not like they can charge him for it. They actually did a new podcast just about this case last year called Blood and Truth, hosted by a journalist named Leonora Lapeter Anton from the Tampa Bay Times. It was a long-form podcast that was about eight episodes long and contained new interviews. And even Tommy himself has said that I've come to terms with the fact that I probably will not get out of prison, but at the very least, I would like to clear my name before I die. That has to be such a difficult situation for anybody who's falsely accused or, you know, wrongly convicted. I think that, you know, if they've got people fighting for them, which we've seen that happen in a lot of different situations, you know, if you get the right people behind you, you can get stuff 
done. I guess the question remains is the evidence compelling enough for him to get like a retrial or an Alfred plea or anything like along those lines. Well, I know that Tommy has maintained that he would not take a plea, like he wants a new trial and wants to clear his name. But given that he doesn't have much time left, if he were to change his mind, I wouldn't blame him one bit. But uh, he has tried to get new DNA testing done and has even made a statement that if they do this testing and the evidence comes out showing that I am guilty, then just I will volunteer to put myself into the into the electric chair and execute myself because uh, I am so certain about my innocence that uh, I know this testing will exonerate me. Uh, I know that earlier this year, shortly after the re- release of the Blood and Truth podcast, the uh, local district attorney's office formed a conviction integrity unit, and they said they were actually going to look at the case, which is pretty much the first time in many, many years they said they would do that. And I think it was because they had a new district attorney elected a few years ago who might have a different attitude towards the case. But that was back in January, and there really hasn't been any progress that I know of, but at least they're doing something, which is, hasn't, which is more than can be saved for the past 15 years or so. Yeah, I mean, definitely sounds like at least somebody's taking an interest into the case that's more so involved than just a podcast or, you know, us talking about it. But I just can't imagine. It it reminds me sort of kind of like the Jeffrey McDonald case, you know, out of the Fort, uh, I forget what. Fort Bragg. (laughs) Fort Bragg. But but it sort of does. It sort of reminds me of of the Jeffrey McDonald case. But the fact that he was so close to death I mean, he, sh- he got shot in the abdomen. I mean, he would have had to shoot himself. I mean, you're taking a... I mean, what the hell, dude? You're taking a pretty big risk if you're going to be doing that. Like, there's no guarantee that you're going to survive. So what are you doing? And what's interesting is that uh, he, he the gunshot wound he had was from a thirty eight, whereas he had a couple of twenty twos lying around, which would have done far less damage. So if you're going to inflict a gunshot wound on yourself, why not use the twenty two? But their explanation for that, I, this is another crazy part of the story. I haven't even told you about the testimony of Edward Williams, which throws another hole in the story. His story is that Tommy made him wait at his house for an hour while he was presumably killing Charlie Mays. And then he picked him up and drove him to the store to pick up the recliner and the chairs he was supposed to be delivering. And Williams said that Tommy then went inside the store, but he had to stop for a moment to urinate in the alley, which makes no sense since the store had bathrooms. (laughs) And then Williams went inside the store and he claimed that Tommy was pointing a gun at him and fired off the gun, and but the gun wound up jamming or ran out of ammo. So Williams took off outside the store into the alley and panicked. But then Tommy came out and said, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought you were a burglar or a robber or something. I, I didn't mean to shoot you. But just to show you this was a misunderstanding, I'm going to give you the gun. And so he placed the gun in Williams's hand. Williams put it into his pocket. And then uh, he was supposed to follow Tommy back inside, but then Williams just took off in the other direction. And his story is that he went across the street to the Kentucky Fried Chicken to call the police. But when they gave him the number, it would turn out to be wrong. So the, so he tried dialing and he couldn't get through to the police. So he panicked again and then ran into a woman who gave him a ride out of town. And then four hours later, he finally decided to turn himself into the police And he gave him the gun, which turned out to be the same gun which had been used to shoot Perry Edwards Sr. So here's a guy turning himself in with one of the murder weapons, which he says the killer placed in his hand and just let him go. And this guy is the key witness for the prosecution. And you can imagine just how many problematic aspects there were to his story, yet it was enough to convince the jury. But I think the logic is that after... Uh, Edward Williams ran out and Felton Thomas ran away that Ziegler knew there were two witnesses against him. So he decided to inflict a gunshot wound on himself to make his story look more convincing. It's just not believable in the slightest. Going into this case, I thought to myself that even if Tommy was guilty, there's no way these events unfolded the way that the prosecution described. (laughs) Do you believe, uh, I mean, did they have uh, GSR or gunshot residue testing back in, you know, 74 when this occurred? Uh, Yes, they they did. And there was a surprising lack of gunshot residue on Tommy's clothes. Uh, He had no gunshot residue whatsoever on his pants, 
which seems very unusual for a guy, a guy who fired five guns and fired 28 bullets. You think there's going to be more gunshot residue on yourself. That's one thing that's always struck me about this case is that there's really no smoking gun against him. It's like, it's hard to imagine that a guy who would fire 28 bullets and more, murder four people, that there's very little physical evidence to really incriminate him. You would think that anyone who would do that would just have a lot more evidence against him uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, and it also goes back to the the whole idea of you, you shooting yourself. I mean, if you're going to shoot yourself, you're not going to shoot yourself with a, you know, you would choose a twenty two over a, a higher caliber gun. I mean, it's just common sense. I mean, let's just be honest. If you if you expect to survive, I mean, you're taking a risk if you're going to shoot yourself with, any, with anything. No matter what, you're taking a risk, but just seems so out of the realm of reality like that he would do that i mean it's it's been done before there are well, documents. sure yeah. sure <laughs> but what's weird is that there are contradictory accounts about the blood on his shirt like some people who, uh, who were at the scene reported that the blood on his shirt was dry which supports his story that he was shot hours ago during the struggle and it's like if he had shot himself after he phoned his police chief friend and the blood would have been very wet because he's going to want to be wounded for as little amount of time as possible before the paramedics arrive. But it, it seemed to suggest that like the blood on his clothing was long dry. That's one of those things that, you know, forensically speaking, you know, in 1975, you know, it's like, oh, man, I don't know if they had the technology to really determine those things and whether or not that is anything that you should be relying on in 2019. And if you thought there was questions about the case, do you think the case would be prosecuted the same way today? Uh, I don't think so. Like, I think they would want more damning evidence because the problem was is that they sent a bunch of evidence to the FBI for testing, then they charged him, and they were so sure that all this evidence was going to come back and incriminate him, and then they were sorely disappointed when they found out, sorry, really not that much, no gunshot residue on his pants, no blood stains found in his car, uh, and so it's like they had to rely on the testimony of these two witnesses whose stories were just not very reliable, and, but it still wound up convincing the jury anyway. So who, in your opinion, are the top suspects, if it's not Ziegler? I think Perry Edwards uh, Jr. definitely is the top suspect. And there's one other suspect I haven't even talked about. And this is one of the most unbelievable aspects of this story. Uh, when Ziegler was originally arrested, the warrant for his arrest listed the two witnesses against him. And instead of Edward Williams and Felton Thomas, it said Edward Williams and Robert Foster. And it was only at the preliminary hearing when the defense was expecting a guy named Robert Foster that this guy named Felton Thomas showed up. And they're like, wait a minute, uh, who's Robert Foster? Who's Felton Thomas? Like, why is the wrong name on the arrest warrant? And the lead investigator, Don Fry, said, oh, that was just a typographical error. I signed the warrant without actually reading it. And another hilarious part is that they published Robert Foster's name in the press for the next several weeks, like in the Orlando Sentinel. And all I can think to myself, if they had put the wrong name in the newspaper, wouldn't you have uh, contacted them and asked them to make a correction? But uh, they were apparently tried to put the, th the story out that Robert Foster, oh, he's not a real person. That's not a real name. He does not actually exist. But the defense started hearing rumors that, yeah, I know a guy named Robert Foster. I believe he was a friend of Charlie Mays, but they couldn't actually find him. So this angle kind of died for about 40 years or so until Lynn Marie Carty took over the case. And she found out that on the same night of the murders, there was a, an attempted robbery at a gas station across the street from the furniture store. And uh, what happened is that the woman on duty grabbed the guy's gun. She described him as like a large black man. And uh, he decided to run away without robbing her. And they filed a report with the police, but this report was never turned over to the defense. Uh, so Lynn Marie Cardi interviewed this woman's daughter who was with her when this incident took place. And she said, yeah, the guy, uh, he kind of fit the description. He resembled the, the, the lead actor from The Green Mile, who, of course, was Michael Clark Duncan. So what uh, Cardi did is that she started searching through inmate profiles with a picture of Michael Clark Duncan next to her monitor, seeing, the, seeing if she could find anyone who was a match. And lo and behold, she gets to an inmate profile for a guy named Robert Foster. 
And uh, then she finds out that this guy was a convicted felon who had been in and out of prison for armed robbery several times. And he had been paroled in the summer of 1975. And she actually spoke to the guy on the phone, who's still alive, and found out that he's real and learned that he was, in fact, friends with Charlie Mays. And the last thing she found out is that his parole was terminated on, I think, January the 15th, 1976 which is the day before the preliminary hearing in the Tommy Ziegler case. So it looks a lot like they were planning to use him as a witness, but then discovered this guy is a convicted felon. He's gonna, he, he isn't very credible. And so they got Felton Thomas instead to take his place and then pretended that Robert Foster did not even exist. But uh, Tommy has looked at a photograph of this guy and he remembers that one of the men who attacked him in the dark was a very large man. And he thinks... This is probably one of the guys who attacked me and threw me around the room. And uh, that's just so fishy. I've never heard anything like this before in a murder case where the name of a witness is on an arrest warrant and then they just get a different witness and pretend that the first witness did not actually exist. When in fact he did and he was a convicted criminal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the irony, like, come on. I mean, like, it, that's not coincidence at all and uh, again let's go back to the fact that there were five guns at the scene five mm -hmm. five guns so you're saying this one individual shot five different guns has no gunshot residue on him and you have all these other circumstantial cases or circumstantial you know pieces but yet he's the one that's placed under arrest four days or three days later yeah, it's just, I think it was tunnel vision. Like, I don't think there was a conspiracy to frame him. I think it's just because it was a small town that had never seen anything like that before. And once Perry Jr. put the idea into his head that he was trapped in a marriage and it was going to kill his wife to cover up the fact that he was gay, they zeroed in on him and found discrepancies in his story and didn't investigate other leads and then uh, arrested him. But over the years, there's been suspicion against Perry Edwards Jr., Robert Foster, Charlie Mays. So at, at the very least, I think they were involved and that this was a murder plot where Perry Jr. wanted to murder his entire family so uh, he could inherit uh, his father's estate. And he kind of, I think it was, it was calculated to plant the seed that maybe Tommy was the real killer so that he would take the rap and he would get to walk away with all the money. It's all, you know, everybody sees green. You know, that's, that's what it seems to boil down to. Like when it comes down to some of these cases, you know, it's just like, okay, we're going to put out an insurance policy on you and uh, yeah, and just so happens you're going to die and boom, you know. But like you mentioned before, you know, Ziegler himself, he was already wealthy. He didn't need the insurance money. A million dollars in, let's say, that's his cash reserve in 1974. That's a hell of a lot of money. Oh, definitely. And he pretty much lived like a modest middle class lifestyle. Like he didn't look as rich as he really was. Like he lived in just a regular middle class house and they had a lot of income from the furniture store and some apartment buildings they owned. But he just did not seem like a guy who felt that money was everything was everything to him. Like he uh, initially turned down the opportunity to be the executor of Perry Sr.'s will saying that I already have your daughter. I already have enough money. Uh, I don't need more. And my thought is, if he wanted to kill uh, Perry and Virginia Edwards, why not wait until they changed the will first? Because then he would have gotten $3 million, but because they, he killed them before he became the executor, it didn't help him at all. So that kind of throws a monkey wrench into the theory that money was the motivating factor of this crime. Do you feel that it's uh, prosecutorial misconduct, or do you think this is just a matter of being in the wrong place at the wrong time and being accused by somebody who probably shouldn't have been taken seriously. Well, I think that they uh, they did withhold some key uh, information from the defense, like the uh, story about Robert Foster. Like they that should have been given to them right away. That this guy who was associated with Charlie Mays with a lengthy criminal record, just the fact that they deliberately covered that part up and pretended he was a fictitious guy, that is misconduct in a, in a, of itself. And uh, also the fact that they had a trial judge who was very very biased against Ziegler. 
that in itself was problematic. Uh, just the fact that he ordered a doctor to prescribe medication to the lone holdout juror, like that in itself probably should have secured him a new trial because I've never heard anything like that before. Just like a new trial with a judge who wasn't so biased against them. So yeah, there was a lot of corruption in this trial. Expand on that a little bit. What so the judge actually forced one of the jurors to, I think we talked about it earlier, but forced him to be on medication? Well, yeah, because she was the lone holdout. She was the only one who wanted, did not want to vote uh, guilty. And she went to the judge complaining that the other jurors were bullying her and intimidating her. And she thought that maybe this should be a mistrial because she didn't want to vote guilty. So he just called up her physician and asked uh, him to prescribe more medication. So the next time they went into deliberations, she was pretty much a zombie, like her will had been shattered because she was about to have an anxiety attack and a nervous breakdown over the whole thing. But once she was on the medication, she voted guilty, but instantly she regretted it. And she's done so many interviews over the years saying that it has haunted her ever since, but she just could not take it anymore because they were literally holding empty guns to her head and pulling the trigger to get her to go vote guilty. So it's just unbelievable. I mean, what if there's any reason for a mistrial or reason for a retrial i think that should that should be the leading cause right there you oh, and, it, oh and one more sorry one more thing is that uh i forgot to mention is that the jury originally when they went to the sentencing phase they voted for life imprisonment but judge paul overruled them and decided to give ziegler the death penalty of his own accord because the death penalty had been ruled unconstitutional in the U.S. during this time period, but uh, they reinstated it in the state of Florida on that exact same day. So now that he, oh, it's so it's like once the judge knew that the death penalty was on the table again, he totally overruled the defense of uh, the, the jury's recommendation for life imprisonment and because and ordered Ziegler to go to the uh, the electric chair just because he hated him so much and. Apparently, Ziegler's defense attorneys told him when he went to death row, uh, don't unpack because we'll probably get your conviction overturned within six months or so. But sadly, he's been there uh, 43 years. So in your opinion, do you see any resolution with this case or do you see that he's going to just kind of write out his sentence? Well, I ordinarily have almost lost hope, but just the fact that the district attorney's office said they would look at the case in January of this year. So until they come back saying that we're not going to do anything, I'll still hold up hope for them. But uh, I mean, with so much time has passed, I can see them just wanting to like ride him out and let him die of natural causes so they don't have to worry about the problem. But I know that the people like Lynn Marie Cardi who are fighting for him will not give up until they can get him released from prison. It's one of those catch 22s, you know, you, you have, as a prosecutor, you want to make sure you uphold your convictions, yada, yada, yada. But the fact that they'll, they can just ride it out until he passes away is just, I think that's corrupt. Mm -hmm. And most of the people who put him away have long since passed away. It's kind of ironic that Judge Paul, uh, he died, I think, in early 2017. He wanted to execute Ziegler so badly, but even though he's on death row, Ziegler still wound up outliving him. So that's kind of ironic. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an ironic twist for sure. As far as this case goes, what is your opinion as far as what the best resolution could be? Well, I think the best resolution is if they could overturn the conviction and let him be a free man again. Uh, even if it doesn't involve a new trial and completely clearing his name, if they just gave him an Alfred plea, uh, I could live with that because at least it would be a free man again because I don't know how they could take him to trial again since all of most of the key witnesses are now dead and a lot of the evidence uh, is is no longer viable now. So I think that would be the best option. But that's what Tommy wants most of all is even if he doesn't actually get released from prison, he just still wants to clear his name because he said the Ziegler name had been a very prominent one in the community before all this happens in Winter Garden for generations. So he just wants to restore his family's good name. And again, why is this case so important to you? Or why do you find it so fascinating? Well, this is my fly on the wall case where if I had to choose one case where I could find out everything that happened from beginning to end, it would be this one. Because even though I have my own theory that Tommy is innocent and that Perry Jr. was the mastermind, I still can't explain everything in this case. Like there are some pieces of the puzzle which just don't entirely 
fit. And I, I felt the same way when I started researching it, where I thought, even if Tommy is guilty, there's no way these events unfolded in this fashion. There has to be more to this story. So I just want to find, would love to know someday the exact series of events of what happened, who was involved, just uh, for my own peace of mind, because this is still, even though I've done over 100 episodes of my podcast, this is still the most difficult case I've ever researched and tried to get a handle on just because of how convoluted it is. I can definitely understand how you could be frustrated by the case and definitely frustrated by the end result. Uh, now, as far as, uh, you know, plug your show. Uh, yes, it's uh, called The Trail Went Cold. Um, we release every single Wednesday. We're, we're going to reach our four-year anniversary in February. We have at the moment... A moment, uh, over 200 either full-length episodes or mini-sodes. So if you're a big fan of the TV show Unsolved Mysteries, and I've always wanted to see it in podcast form, you'll love The Trail Went Cold because we cover a lot of cases from the show, but have a lot of additional information that you did not see on the original show. And we cover a whole bunch of very weird and unusual cold cases. The more bizarre, the better, I, I always say, just because uh, I love the challenge of going after the cases where it's just so hard to figure out what actually happened. Yeah, and a lot of these things can be mysteries. And so it's definitely a fun, it's a fun exercise in uh, flexing your investigative uh, abilities. So definitely, uh, I just wanted to thank you for your time and uh, sharing some of your, uh, your insights and obviously a case that, you know, holds a personal touch to you. So I just am very appreciative of your time. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Uh, one more thing I'll mention is that we originally met on podcast row at CrimeCon and CrimeCon next year is going to be in Orlando. And Winter Garden is only, I think, about a 20 minute drive outside the city. So I'm considering the possibility of visiting the furniture store because apparently it's still there. So uh, when I'm at CrimeCon next year, I might take a field trip. And yeah, well, see where this happened. <laughs> I might join you. <laughs> yes, that would be awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, again, thanks so much for your time. I know that uh, you're just coming off your holidays. So uh, enjoy the rest of the week. And I will let you know when uh, everything goes, uh, you know, online. And uh, again, thanks so much. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, very cool. Thanks, Robin. All right. Have a good night. <laughs> thanks, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much to Robin Warder of The Trail Went Cold for coming into the studio this week to discuss the Tommy Ziegler case. And thank you guys, the listeners, for tuning in. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't exist. So if you guys are a fan of the show and would like to help support, you can click on the donate button on the left-hand side of slowburnmedia.com. That's slow minus the w or via the venmo app via my username at bill huffman dash three i will also provide a link in the show notes now i will also be on podcast row at CrimeCon 2020 in orlando may 1st through the third and if you've never been i highly suggest it because it is definitely a bucket list item for anybody who's really into true crime because it really gives you an up close and personal opportunity to talk to the people that you've seen on TV for years and years. So I have a promo code. If you want to save on the ticket, the promo code is Amy2020. Again, if you guys like the show, leave me a five-star review on wherever you listen to podcasts. That does help keep the show in the spotlight. If you want to keep up to date with the new shows I have in the pipeline, you can always follow me on Twitter at BillHuffman3. And again... Thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, peace. You know how we mentioned that there was truth serum used in this case? There are a bunch of YouTube videos that are available of Tommy Ziegler actually being given the truth serum. So I'm just going to play a clip for you guys. If you want to check out the videos, you can. They are under Tommy Ziegler truth serum on YouTube and it's very easy to find. So take a listen. It's pretty wild. And to think that this actually occurred in our criminal justice system is kind of wild. So listen and just imagine how crazy this is. 
Now, I want to go back to Christmas Eve and help you try to recall part of that. How do you feel about going back and trying to recall part of Christmas Eve? Shine, fine. Okay. So what we're going to do now, we're going to go back and try to recall that. Remember as much as you can. You've just not like it's Christmas Eve last year. I want you to remember it as clearly as you can, as though you were there. Okay. Okay. And I want you to imagine that you've had a hard day. It's been very busy on Christmas Eve. You were very busy that day. Yes, sir. And that you're closing up the store. Now remember it as though it were happening now. Try to remember closing up the store. And as you remember it, describe it and tell me about it. I was cold. I turned on the heat unit on the office side. Went into the front office. and Daddy made fun of me because I turned the heat unit on. Mother went over to Food World to get some chicken broth. didn't have any. She came back to the store. She made the comment that the heat was on. She was going to Thriftway and trying to get some chicken broth. She made the comment that the heat was on. And they all laughed. I told them that I was cold. And went and turned the heat off. She said she was going to Jimmy Swift way to try to get some chicken broth for the dressing. She and Curtis closed up the front. the store. I closed up the back. Drove my truck through the gate and locked the gate and went home. When I got home, Curtis Dunaway was backing out of the driveway so that I could pull my truck in. Okay, Tommy, I want you to start now. 
not trying to remember, trying to recall it as though it were happening, try to put it in the present tense as though it were happening now. Curtis was backing out of the driveway so I could pull my truck in. He backed out of the driveway so I could pull my truck in and park it where I park it. He pulled his car down between the alleyway of the two cars of the two houses and unlocked his trunk. I unlocked the trunk of our car. I went over and helped him carry the pies and the cookies. Put them in the trunk of our car. I miss Christmas presents. How are you feeling as you're doing all this? How are you feeling about the Christmas Eve being over and looking forward to the evening? What are you planning? What are you thinking about? I'm thinking about going back to the store.